and welcome back to Watch Box Studios. I'm your host, Tim Masso. This is Watches Tonight. This evening, we are asking why watches are now so expensive, or at least certain of watches. And we are leading off with Tudor versus Oris, which might become the dive watch battle of 2021. We're talking sub $5,000 dive watches, all of that, and your viewer wrist shots right here on Watches Tonight. In the box, we have Edward Ledden of Sweden, Blue Shirt Buddha, Enrique Cassiano. We have Wachusiast from Dubai, Dan C.T., Sean Hansen, Richard Combs from South Florida, Mr. No Date from London. We've got Frederick A. from Sweden and Sean B. from Temple, Texas. Greg E., Marceau R., Mateo C., Marked Butik from Poland, Mez9, and Hale Bop. We've got Mohammed bin Khalifa Al Khalifa from Bahrain staying up late with us and Terry C. from Toronto. All right. Remember, guys, open up a different window. Keep me streaming, but check out thewatchbox.com. That would be my favorite page on thewatchbox.com, but you're free to choose your own. With many brands and over 3,000 late model pre-owned and vintage watches live right now, it is your one-stop shop, whether you're shopping or just window shopping. All right, viewer wrist shots. Let's see what you got here. Eric G starts us in stunning style. He likes Dibatoon as well, with his DB28 Tourbillon in rose gold and black zirconium. Stunning, and ravishing, and my God, probably my next watch. If not the model, definitely the brand. But we've got competition. Courtesy of San Diego takes in the SoCal Sun with his Rolex Skydweller and McLaren. We've got Khalid A checking in from Dubai with his Ford GT, no joke, and the matchless Rolex Cellini Prince in white gold. Mike P joins us from the road with his newly minted AP Royal Oak Offshore Chronograph at the wheel. And Jaja is on point with his uncommon Patek Fleet 5396-1G white gold annual calendar on full bracelet. Guys, please keep them coming. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see who else is in the box. We've got Daniel Hill, Turkish Meister from Turkey. William Baker from Connecticut, USA. We got Seif K joining in from Canada. We've got Daniel Hill, MCC Le Chinois from New Jersey. Adam Crossfire, John N. We've got Maserashi joining in from Richard Richmond, Virginia, one-time site of the World Championships of Cycling. We've got Joe Pinto from Louisville, Kentucky, Eddie Landsberg from Harvard Yard, and Alexi Simola of Finland. Okay, guys, so let's talk about why watches are so expensive right now. It is a perplexing thing because realistically, they're not that expensive. 99% of the watches in circulation depreciate. It's that 1% from a handful of brands that has become absolutely perplexing and frankly, attention getting. So you might've noticed silly things happening at this past weekend's Philip Geneva auction number eight. And by silly things, I mean a vintage Patek Philippe 2523 world time with cloisonne a dial sold for over seven million U.S. dollars, which is silly money for any watch. Let's be honest, but maybe not the real surprise here, because watches like this from Patek Philippe in particular have been pulling down big coin for a long time. So. What really surprised me was the modern and mainstream models in this particular auction, and they commanded outrageous sums. How outrageous? Well, recent production watches from just the last decade, you could see there the estimate for that Patek Philippe Aquanaut travel time. What did it go for? 85,000 Swiss francs, remember, is about 85,000 US dollars. It's pretty much one to one. Crazier still for the annual calendar. Again, these are watches that just came out in the last decade, the annual for well over 100 grand. And look at the estimates, guys. They're not just beating the estimates, they're doubling, tripling, quadrupling the estimates in some of these cases. Late model watches generally classed normally classed as used or pre-owned watches, not vintage, not by any means. Um, they're occupying the price points generally reserved for true vintage watches, or at least established vintage investment grade watches from just 10 to 15 years ago. These are truly incredible prices. Take a look right there. Uh, if you're not shocked by the nearly $600,000 for the low volume 2013 5711 P in Platinum. Granted, that's a rare piece. They only made about 50 of those. But look right next to it. You've got a Nautilus 5712, a watch that is still in production, available new for $44,950. You can buy that watch new for under $45,000. And if we can slide right back to that last slide, you could see this one went at auction, factory sealed, for a quarter million dollars. So this is all getting very weird. So why is this happening at the same time that Rolex 
AP, Patek, and heck, now, even Vacheron and Longo with certain models, all of them have waiting lists for certain new watches. All of this is happening simultaneously, and this is not causality. We can identify why all these things are, in fact, connected. It's not happenstance, nor is it just curious. This is a result of several things happening at the same time right now. The first of which, at the upper end of the market, is bored rich people. And make no mistake, this is affecting everything from fine art to cars to Bitcoin, non-fungible tokens, dog coin, if you're Elon Musk. All of this is happening at once because people with a lot of money are going online and they're shopping or they're bidding, or they're buying. All of which is to say, Patek Philippe, and this is like, this is where they're playing right now, but Patek Philippe, Richard Mille, Audemars Piguet, small independents of high standing like Regep Regepi, Acrivia, um, Francois Paul Jorn and the Grunefelds. Not exclusively, there are others, but these are some of the top names out right there. And when people with a lot of money are looking to buy stuff online, they're buying blue chip names. They're buying things they can be comfortable buying online sight unseen. And those tend to be the high level names that everyone already knows. You still need money to play the game. But at a slightly lower level, we're seeing bored average people. And they too are driving the market. We've seen certain Rolex models that start at reasonable prices become downright unreasonable. And even models like the Oyster Perpetual 41 that came out last year, those too are now five-figure watches, despite being priced far below. You want a Hulk? You want a Sermit, I guess they're called now? Uh, well, I gotta be honest, the Sermit is a crazy watch, and it's being driven as much by the mass market as by the truly rich. You don't necessarily need six figures worth of income to at least get involved in the contemporary pre-owned Rolex marketplace right now. For a lot of folks, it's gonna be that instead of a Harley Davidson or a Boston Whaler. Other markets, Tudor, we're gonna see a lot of demand for stuff like the new Sterling Silver 925. More on that in a moment. The Black Bay 58 has never been an easy piece to get since it came out in 2018. We're also seeing certain Omegas. Obviously, yes, the Silver Snoopy 3, that one's obvious. But we're also seeing certain Seamaster models now and moon watches become, if, that's how you know we keep it real, guys. <laughs> They're awesome, don't worry about it. Um, but the thing is, you're seeing a lot of models like the Moon Watches now with wait lists of at least a few weeks. And that used to never be the case with a general production Omega watch. I would also say this, cheap cash, and maybe not in the obvious way. Central banks don't lend money to individuals, or at least not individuals who don't control enormous institutional cash cows. But if you are a bank, Money is cheap, and if you are a customer of the bank, eventually that money finds its way downstream. And you find that the dovish monetary policy around the world, from Japan to Europe to the United States, has found its way first into conventional assets years ago, and we're finally seeing how this impacts the collectibles marketplace, art, vintage goods cryptocurrency, and yes, watches. Not directly, again, central banks don't lend money to you and me, but we are seeing the wealth effect of people who are, for example, buying a lot of stock, getting deeply invested in certain commodities or bonds. People who are doing well right now in all of the classes of investment that are not simply real estate or cash. The cash finds its way there, people have more money, they feel richer, and then they spend it on stuff. And the stuff they're spending it on is at least in part luxury watches. Now social media, I have to admit here that I'm a big part of the problem. I advertise things and make them salient so you can buy them quickly with a click. I'm not the only one. That said, there is plenty of exposure, but it tends to be very deep and narrow. You're not seeing a whole lot of, say, Maitre du Temple chapter three, which you'll find in that photo. You're seeing a lot of Jorn, you're seeing a lot of Patek, you're seeing a lot of RM, you're seeing a lot of Rolex, some Omega, AP, Vacheron, and Longa, which means along with a few marquee independents, that's what people generally wanna buy. It's difficult to go far afield and say, hey, you know what I really want? I want a 2001 Cavalli Mangusta. And it's really hard to say, hey, you know what, in spite of everything I'm seeing online, I really want to spend my money on a Chopard Engine 1 tourbillon. People just don't work that way. What they see is what they want, and often what they want is what they get if they've got the money. Finally, e-commerce. 
All the suggestions and the cash in the world would amount to nothing if you couldn't spend it more or less from home. So, nobody shopped from home during the 1918 Spanish flu. It wasn't a thing back then. I don't know, maybe the Sears Roebuck catalog was a big deal back in those days when you had nothing else to do. But today, we can go online and buy a watch from the other side of the world, often shopping different countries on, say, Chrono24, as if they were interchangeable vendors down the block. So e-commerce has increased the reach of money to find things and bid it up around the world. It's almost now like oil pricing. When oil goes up somewhere, it goes up everywhere, and the same is true, for example, of Rolex. That said, one problem we don't appear to have is supply chains. Not for luxury watches, not for Swiss watches. For the most part, Switzerland is like a vertically integrated manufacturer. Unless you're dealing with a very low-end brand selling watches you know, in the sub-2,000, sub-3,000 dollar price point, we're going to have cases, crystals, clasps, and bracelets made in China, and thus imported to Switzerland. We're not seeing huge holds ups, for example, Richemont brands, LVMH brands, Swatch brands. They're mostly able to make and ship product. Their restriction, their restriction is places where they really can't sell it. So right now they're doing great in mainland China and there's recovery in the United States, but Hong Kong is still relatively fallow compared to where it was and continental Europe for the most part is slightly behind where it would have been. So. For the most part, supply chains, which are limiting everything from the chemicals needed to make mattresses to the microchips needed to make cars, not a problem keeping luxury watches in stock. So let's jump into the box and see where you guys are. We've got Alexi, Pete's Timepiece Safari, we've got Time Hill. My goodness, this chat box moves fast. Hans N saying, crazy prices on all watches. Time Hill saying, I guess our interests are in an area where the big dogs play, exactly, and where the dog coin plays. Increasingly, you can buy all this crap with cryptocurrency. And then right here, we have Abdul R of Germany saying, I think also paying with online buying, the feel of money is totally different than paying with cash or at the store. It's much easier to overpay if it's only numbers on the screen. And a conversation whose antecedent I obviously missed, Sean Hansen at Edward Ledden, Alfa Romeo. And then right here we have Eric B saying, oil can't break $70. True, because there's a lot of it. But Rolex, that's a different matter. And then right here we've got Karate Chop saying, Black Bay 58 is my daily driver. And then right here we've got Eric B saying, summer demand just isn't there. I don't know. I think summer demand's gonna be pretty hot, at least in the United States. We're already up. And then we've got David Finkelstein reminding me that Dogcoin is pronounced Dogecoin, of course. But I know it's a Shiba Inu, I got that much right. And then here we've got all sorts of fans of Dogecoin. And Matthew G joining in. We've also got some friends from around the world. We've got Tongue Sack saying, majority of Rolex buyers can't actually afford luxury watches. They want a safe exit when it all goes south. Then I wouldn't buy a Sermit at $30,000, or for that matter, a Daytona. And then right here, we've got Love Watches USA. Happy Monday, Tim, and all fellow watch enthusiasts. And then we've got Thomas Burnett, always friendly, always present, always a good guy. Jaybo Surf, our friend from Adelaide, Australia. And we've got Christopher H. and Eric B. Guys, thank you so much for joining me from wherever you are. Uh, let's quickly jump into viewer wrist shots number two, because I asked, you answered, and now here it comes. JC from Portugal proudly features his Porsche design P6000 by Eterna in spectacular light. That might be the pure photography award of the night. Will J and his Omega Speedmaster, first Omega in space, match nicely with his Apollo era 1969 Mustang. And yes, I know, the first Omega in space did not fly on Apollo, but that is a great space age group shot he's got right there. Christopher N and his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra hit the water in West Ocean City, Maryland. Macau B of Poland shares his spectacular Omega Seamaster Aquaterra world timer behind the wheel. Ralph P is in Bab El Shams, Dubai with the 2021 Tudor Black Bay 925, which is a wonderful segue to our main feature of the night, the best dive watch deals of 2021. Can you guess? If you haven't, you'll know by the end of the show. Well, the 2021 Rolex Submariner continues to suck up oxygen, and frankly, the world wonders when the new for 
2007 Blancpain 50 Fathoms will get an all-new edition, budget-friendly luxury divers seem to be having a real moment right here and right now. It started last year with the $3,500 Oris Aquas Caliber 400, but we've reached a sort of critical mass of no compromise options this year with, amongst others, Tudor, Oris, and even Bell & Ross getting in on the act. All these watches, sub $5,000 and quite sub $5,000, give you what you would have gotten in, for example, an Omega Seamaster just a few years ago and a Rolex Submariner just a few years before that. In some cases, they're going even farther than those famous nameplates, giving you power reserve and warranty uncommon in the industry. So. Obviously, this year, the Tudor Black Bay 58 925 is probably the watch of our moment. Possibly the best thing to come out during this year's Watches and Wonders, it also makes a heck of a lot of sense, as at $4,300 in sterling silver, it only costs $3,700 more than a Black Bay 58 in steel. I would say that since 2018, the Black Bay 58 has been by far Tudor's most desirable all-around watch. Basically, everything you loved about the Heritage Black Bay but in a 39 millimeter case that's truer to vintage and a heck of a lot thinner. It is a sterling silver watch with a top dial. The top dial and the sterling silver creating a remarkably compelling if subtle color contrast and this is already being delivered, which is refreshing. You've already seen a couple of in-the-wild shots on this show. It's 39 millimeters by 11.9, which means it's much thinner, not thinner, but much thinner than both the standard Heritage Black Bay and the 12.8 millimeter thick Rolex Submariner. And at 47.8 millimeters lug to lug, it's wearable on just about any wrist. Now, it's available exclusively on a strap for now to keep costs down. I would love to see a full sterling silver bracelet because A, I think it would be cool, and B, I have never seen such a thing in all my times in luxury watches. But for now, it's on a strap. You have your choice of those two that you see right there. It has a dedicated caliber, the caliber 5400, display case back, great tech, controversial use of a case back sapphire. I'm not sure we need to see this movement. Technically proficient and yes, very durable, but I don't think there's any need to see this. I would rather have an extra silver dollars worth of precious metal on that case back than see the caliber 5400. That said, you're getting a three-day power reserve. It's a chronometer. You're getting a balance architecture that is hugely shock resistant. You're getting a silicon hairspring. And the whole thing is 26 millimeters compared to 31.8 for a standard Black Bay movement. Even better, it's 4.99 millimeters thick compared to 6.5 for a standard Black Bay 5602. So not only did they make the watch smaller, but they made the movement smaller just for the case. And and that is something you rarely see in the world of Rolex and Tudor, where generally one movement will be built for a huge range of watches rather than tailored expressly to the case. That is something you expect of, well, the likes of de Batoon and the Grunefelds. So, $4,300 and new, a five-year warranty. The warranty at Tudor used to be two years, now it's five. That should be what you get because other brands of lesser stature than Tudor and Rolex are doing five-year warranties. But still, it catches us up to the world of Rolex and Omega and Breitling, which is where, frankly, Tudor should be price regardless. Now, who is the target audience for the $16,800 yellow gold? Black Bay 58, 18 carat, I don't know. With the sterling silver watch this good, why would you pay almost 17 grand for that? Yes, it's got a very 2021 green dial and bezel, but still, the buy is now the sterling silver. Whether you were thinking of gold or steel, this is the one to get. Just get silver and call it a day, guys. But here's the thing. There might already be a better 2021 budget dive watch option. For the same money, the 2021 Oris Carl Brashear Caliber 401. This is the third bronze dive watch, a limited edition, the third in the series honoring American combat swimmer Carl Brashear of the U.S. Navy, and I think it is by far the most desirable of the current trilogy. So, 2,000 pieces, and it has the stylish solid case back that, frankly, Tudor should have opted for on its sterling silver black bay. That's what you do when you've got a workmanlike movement with accomplished spec, 
but not necessarily a polished aesthetic. This is a great looking case back that's relevant to the model, its namesake, and the spirit of the watch overall, because that vintage diving helmet matches beautifully to the diver's 65 derived case style, the limited size, and the bronze fitments. This is a great looking case back, guys, and no, I would not take a display case back over this. So, ideally sized at 40 millimeters, even if Tudor does beat this watch in terms of thickness, this is 13.3. I still think this is game on if, for example, you loved last year's Oris Aquis Caliber 400, but its 43.5 millimeter case was just too big. That's a big watch. Almost 44 millimeters in this day and age is probably bigger than the market wants. But I had a chance to review what we'll call the Coral 3. The size is perfect. The fit is beautiful. All of a sudden, smaller wrists and guys with more traditional tastes or a taste for discretion, this is your Oris. And this is your caliber 400 Oris. No date dial, small seconds. It's the caliber 401, basically the same thing. Slightly different dial aesthetic. And the no date Coral dial in blue, let's go full screen with this one, uh, alongside the bronze case with the simulated patina, the fotina, and the bronze coloration of the hands and indices. This is a really sharp look. The aesthetic equal of the Tudor Diver, and neither watch offers a bracelet, so we are talking apples to apples here. Uh, you get an Erica's original MN strap on this Oris. Now, let's talk about caliber 400. Here, in small seconds form, you're getting a game changer in a sub $5,000 watch. You don't just expect much more than a Salida in this price range. This doesn't just give you more than a Salida. It gives you Rolex level precision. It gives you five days of power reserve, which neither Rolex nor Tudor is doing. And it gives you a 10 year warranty and a 10 year service interval. Again, even Tudor trails, 10 years between services and 10 years of warranty is frankly what every watch in this day and age should offer. And it even outdoes the new sort of Richemont corporate eight year warranty by two full years. I think this is going to put pressure on everyone to go out to a decade within the next 36 months. I don't see Oris being the only one in the 10 year warranty game in just a few years from now. This is going to be a new standard, and we're going to look back at Oris as the first to do it. Okay, maybe Oris and Fabergé, but that's it. Now, quoted at minus three plus five seconds per day, they're, they're actually attesting to a precision. So if the watch doesn't run to that timing, they face warranty claims. That is how much confidence they have. Companies that are actually making a precision attestation, well, let's see, you've got Rolex for one, you've got Patek Philippe, and, well, you've got Oris. One of these things is not like the other. That's August Company for Oris. And finally, you get a silicon anti-magnetic escapement, so you're getting real value. And instead of doing this sloppily with one huge barrel and terrible timing at full wind or minimum wind, they went with two barrels, so the thing will actually keep good time in days two, three, and four. Now, $4,200, and it's a limited edition of 2,000 pieces, so you're getting a little bit of exclusivity here that you don't get on the Tudor. A small difference in price, and if I had to bet, I'd say there's probably a little bit of bargaining to be had at your Oris dealer, whereas for Tudor, I think what you see is what you pay. So this is an awesome piece. Viewer wrist shots number three. We're going to take a look at yours and then talk about another contender for your budget dive watch money this year. Viewer wrist shots number three, starting out with Mark E in Doha, Qatar with his Zenith Chronomaster Heritage 146. And you can see there's a little bit of dust on the window, but he is aloft in a skyscraper. Abdul R of Germany and his Seiko Alpinist trial a fully loomed NATO strap for his birthday. Abdul travels safe. I know you're going home to see some friends and celebrate the holiday, so be well. Robert C and his great white Omega Seamaster enjoy a seafood dinner to match. Now who's at the top of the food chain, great white? Scott S. from New Hampshire is at the doctor with his Tudor Pelagos left-hand drive and his Mercedes-Benz S-Class W126, a vintage late production W126, judging by the airbag. Severin G. is a man after my own heart with the Zinn EZM3 in Cologne, Germany and a lovely and luminous cuff. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, folks, to see your pieces on my pixels. Now, we talked about Tudor and we talked about Oris, and I think it's important to mention that there is a third contender for your sub $5,000 dive watch money this year in the marketplace. And yes, Bell and Ross 
also wants your dive watch dollars in 2021. So the Bell & Ross BR0392 Diver Military is going to be their play. And as you can see, this is a very different looking watch in both composition and, and custom than either the Oris or the Tudor. Those are both vintage inspired divers with modern movements inside. Whereas this is resolutely modern, at least in the sense that it is entirely in black ceramic. So Bell & Ross launched its first square instrument style diver in 2017. And by that, I mean they took their square instrument style case that came out in 2005, their best known design, and then they combined it with an ISO 6420 unidirectional bezel, constant seconds, 300 meter case, all of those features that we associate with a modern dive watch, and they packed all of that into black ceramic. So I would say since many also associate Bell & Ross with military aviators, and having been in the Navy I know many military aviators do wear Bell & Ross as an article of fashion more than anything, but it comes together with the 2021 Military Diver. This is a watch that really does look convincing, both as a military-inspired timepiece and as a Bell & Ross. If you're going to buy a Bell & Ross, you're going to buy the instrument style case. You want the watch that looks like an analog flight deck instrument from a 20th century aircraft. You don't necessarily want one of the BR V94s or the BR02 or something that's round. Uh, you don't necessarily want a watch that doesn't look like a classical Bell & Ross instrument. Just like when you're buying an Omega, a lot of folks don't go for the Constellations and they don't go for the DeVilles. And with Bell & Ross, the instrument watch is their Speedmaster Professional. It is their Submariner. It is their Reverso. It is their Navitimer. It's the one you think of when you think of the brand. And this might be the best all-around version of that watch. A ceramic case is a wonderful thing because although it is a Salida movement inside, you're really paying for the style and the durability externally. With a ceramic case, you know that the watch is never going to scratch, never going to scuff, and unlike the Tudor and the Oris, this Bell & Ross diver is going to look just as good 10, 20 years down the road, provided you don't slam it against a slab of granite. And as part of the Chanel family of companies, Bell & Ross gets access to cases made by GNF Chatelain of Le Loque, which is to say, very, very good stuff, as they've also made cases and fixtures for, amongst others, Chanel, MBNF and Richard Mille, and that's a pretty good company to be in. I should also say that the Chanel family of companies is now serious, as it includes Bell & Ross, a share of F. Pigeon, Chanel's own high horology watches, Chanel's luxury horology watches, and Romain Gautier. So Bell & Ross is, well, amongst some very impressive names within this company. I'll also say, for $4,500, you get a fantastic Pelican-style case that really looks the goods. That's a lot like what you get if you buy a Blancpain 50 Fathoms, and it is loaded with accessories like separate retaining bars, tools, and you do get a second strap in rubber, which would probably be my preference for wearing this watch, which is a true diver and 300 meters. Also nicely loomed, Bell & Ross loom is no joke. I can't help but feel though that Bell & Ross is a bit of a disadvantage in the budget diver class that's increasingly dominated and defined by both sub-omega prices and mechanical innovations. Salita power by itself used to be more than enough in this price point. I'm wondering if in 2021, Bell & Ross needs more than high-grade ceramic and high style to make its case for your $4,500. And let's think about this for a minute, because even two years ago, it was customary to use a basic ETA or Salida movement in a dive watch at this price point. But today, Tudor, Oris, and heck, even Longines and Mido have changed the rules of engagement with movements that offer a lot more than an SW200 or an SW300 from Salida. On this watch, for example, you get a three-day power reserve, you get an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. Uh, on some watches in this price point, such as, for example, the Mido Diving Star, COSC 600 meter, you get a helium escape valve. You get a silicon hairspring. You get a 600 meter diving depth you get an 80-hour power reserve, all of that for $1,700. And yeah, this has to be considered a contender for your sub-$5,000 dive watch money, in as much as you could probably buy this and then go out and buy another watch in the budget price point for the money that you have left over. So, 
Bell and Ross, I think you're easily the third man in this race. The watch looks great, and if you fall in love with the look of the watch, $4,500 is sound pricing. But I think the Oris and the Tudor are more interesting because they're equally compelling inside and outside the case. They look great, and you know the movement you're getting is of real horological value. But, 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 there is a but. How does the Tudor Black Bay 58 925 compare to my favorite sub $5,000 dive watch? You're going to find out in a moment, but let's check out what we've got going on here in the chat box. We've got a friend joining from Stockholm, Sweden. We've got many folks who are fans of budget divers. Uh, Time Hill saying, though, true... True that about the Bell and Ross movement being a Salida. John Doe saying Mito is a deal, and I happen to agree there. I think Mito watches are spectacular. Everything they make isn't great, but they have a couple of dress watches and dive watches that frankly look and feel like they're worth three times what Mito is asking for them. And then right here we have Alex O saying Bell and Ross does need an in-house movement probably. And then Karate Chop is correct that 300 meters is not 1,000 feet. I know, I think it's like 980 four feet. And you know what? If you buy a JLC dive watch, they get that right. No one else does. Everyone else is estimating for those of us in the colonies. We've got Edward Ledden saying to Simon Templar, a Volvo P1800 is a beautiful car. And if you love the P1800 and you love watches, check out the Jager Le Coult forum on watchprosite.com where the moderator, in addition to his 200,000 posts, frequently posts about his Volvo P1800. And then right here we have Abdul saying, wow, nice case, really like a Blancpain, great presentation. And then we've got East of Suez joining in from Japan early in the morning. Thank you for getting up early with me, East of Suez. We got Time Hill saying, I'm warming up fast on the Bell and Ross. And then we've got Simon asking, is Volvo like a new MAME? If so, what's the joke? I gotta ask too, because I usually stay on top of cars online, but if there's a Volvo MAME and it's a vintage Volvo MAME, I'm definitely behind the eight ball on that one. And then, let's see what else is going on here. We got Thomas Burnett saying, I love the olive dial on that Bell and Ross. Burning Mr. B, Debatoon on Tim's wrist called it. Probably going to happen. Well, Matt Foster says, I can't do a square watch regardless. But Debatoon on my wrist, guys, that's going to happen sooner rather than later. I'm a car guy, but I think I went from being a car guy who likes watches to now being a watch guy who likes cars. After seven years in the business, I think it's official. I'm now, I'm now a watch guy who likes cars. And then we've got Enrique C saying, the Mito decompression timer reissue is also amazing. That is true, guys. You gotta check that one out from last year. All right, what is my favorite sub $5,000 dive watch and how do Tudor and Oris compare? Well, that would be the then new for 2020 Ball Engineer Hydrocarbon Original. At 40 millimeters in stainless steel, this small brand diver is immediately competitive in size and stature on the wrist with the Tudor and the Oris, but I will say it is the thickest. at 40 14.6 millimeters thick. It is not a svelte watch. And with a basic Salida movement, the ball also loses some ground out of the gun, out of the gate. At the gun, it's maybe two steps behind the other two. But warranty is three years with registration, so one year better than Bell and Ross, but still not on par with Tudor and Oris. Ultimately, though, Ball takes the Zin approach of surrounding a basic, well-regulated automatic movement with proprietary technologies that add huge value. And this is where the watch becomes a real contender. This is where I feel the ball catches up with our two leading candidates from this show. Starting with 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetism, this is, by another measure, 1,000 Gauss which is Milgauss, which is the same as the famous Rolex Technician's watch. So this is a Milgauss anti-magnetic timepiece, and I would bet probably a little bit more based on the Moon Metal alloy that they're using to encircle the movement. It is also 7,500G shock resistant. Remember, a Moon watch is about 5,000G, and that's used for space travel. This is 7,500, and it uses two proprietary time proprietary technologies to make that happen. They have a locking regulator, similar to a free sprung, but more adjustable for the balance. And then they have something called a spring lock, which is basically a hoop that encloses the hairspring and allows you to just beat on the watch without excessive displacement of the hairspring. And that is one of the factors that causes great 
imprecision on watches, displacement of the hairspring due to shock, but also damage to the hairspring due to, sh due to shock. And with the spring lock system, they've got that 7,500 G shock resistance in a watch that frankly goes above and beyond what you'd probably ever need on a diver, and that is their technology. They're using something very few others are in the luxury watch class, and that is a tritium tracer dial, glass capsules that include a phosphorescent gas with beta emitter tritium. So that activates the phosphorescence, which means you don't need to charge this loom before lighting it up at night. Pull it out of a dive locker after a year in the dark at night, it will still glow just like that. Full dial, full bezel. And I should mention, there's a handy day date complication. For the 99% of the time, you are not underwater with your dive watch. The only watch in this discussion on a bracelet also comes with a diving clasp. And you can see, not only is the thing damn overbuilt, and given the price point, impressively constructed with removable links fixed by screws, but there are two dive adjustments, one on each side of the clasp here, and the whole thing is attached to the case with not one, but two screw fixed bars on each side. You get two diving extensions, and the actual release for the clasp is a dual trigger. There's a crown protection system. I actually didn't think this was of any value until I had my chance to review one, but it is remarkably solid and precise and actually gives you panorai levels of coverage because you can't hit the crown directly on the head when it's locked. And all of this is just $3,200 from Ball, which in my mind is a fantastic deal because while it is a Salida caliber, you're getting all of those other technologies that probably makes this watch more comparable to a Zinn than to the Oris and the Tudor, but very competitive for your dive watch money. And again, it's proof that an in-house caliber is not the be all and end all of the purchase decision. So ultimately, if you're shopping in this segment, ultimately, uh, I think the Oris and the Ball are going to be my favorites. The Tudor is very cool, but I like what you're getting with the Oris, and it's hard to argue against a 10-year warranty and a 5-day power reserve. With the size of the case, the look of the watch, and the value you're getting inside, as much as I like the Sterling Silver Tudor, I think I would buy the Oris over the Tudor. And if I had to choose, I would probably buy the Ball over all of them for what you're getting sans movement. Now, Nevertheless, this is going to be a great year for budget price dive watches. So if you're in the market, you've got great choices. Not just the watches that have come out this year, but the watches that have come up leading to this year. Uh, meaning, yeah, the Rolex Submariner is probably still going to be the dive watch on the tip of everyone's tongue. And if you want to go your second choice, for most people, that's going to be a Omega Seamaster. But if you want to look a little bit deeper and spend less money, there are some fantastic ways to get a dive watch on your wrist this summer for less than the cost of a used Honda motorbike. Burning Mr. B asking, Tim, what is on your wrist? This is not a Dibitoon. This is actually a Wilbur watch that Jason Wilbur sent to me for a review. It's so big you can see it without the macro camera. So he's an industrial designer. He worked for Honda for 10 years and he designed the original Devon Tread. And so he sent me one of his first own brand watches under the Wilbur name for a review. And since I've never done a week on the wrist type review for my, my hands-ons, I did a unboxing and I'm doing a week on the wrist of the watch. I'm gonna time it, I'm gonna get precision. All those questions you have when you buy a watch, I'm gonna find out tell the good and the bad in my review of this watch. But that's what's on my wrist right now. I can see we've got Eric R saying Zin U2 2000 meter. And that's a great idea. We've got Simon Holt saying Zin U2 rules, but I have broken my stem thread. Eh, sometimes this happens with watches. Let me know how they take care of you on the service side. That's what really matters. And then right here, we've got League of History asking, what is your favorite Oris watch? I think that if I were to buy an Oris watch, I would probably buy the standard Aqua State caliber 400. Uh, 43.5 is big, but it doesn't quite wear that big. It's short across the wrist, and I love that turquoise fade dial that they put on it with matching turquoise ceramic bezel insert. So that probably would be the Oris watch I would choose. And if I weren't choosing that, it might be the Carl Brashear 3 or possibly one of the Artelier 10-day power reserves, because those are really neat watches and hugely underrated. Because they're manual wind and they're dress watches, a lot of people don't talk about those Oris models. But the Caliber 110 series definitely deserves your attention. They're awesome watches with real movement interest for those of us who are interested in that kind of thing at an affordable price. I would even go so far as to say some of the Caliber 110 watches are like buying an IWC Portugueser automatic for half the money 
and getting three extra days of power reserve. I really think they're that good. What else are you guys saying right here? Let's interact a little bit. We got some time still on the clock. We got Mr. No Date saying Zin U50 for the win. If you were looking for a sub $5,000 dive watch, I would say Zin U50, full tegament, full bracelet. That's the way to do it. You're still going to come in at a price less than $3,000 US dollars, and you're getting an unbelievably durable watch from a company that's known for making dive watches, pilot's watches, and driver's watches. By the way, I'm looking forward to getting a little bit closer to the Zin U500 for a review, so we'll see where I can get on that. Uh, what else is going on right here? We've got Simon T saying, I love making money, and money buys cars and watches. Therefore, by the transitive property of algebra, watches love Dogecoin. See, I got it right. I can learn. I would also say watches love cash. Frankly, if you've got cash in the watch space, you can almost always get a bigger discount than if you have to go to some sort of a lender. This helps more if you're at local jewelers and smaller pre-owned vendors, but it's a good idea just in general. If you're buying luxury watches, have cash in hand. What else is going on right here? We have Abdul saying the Mito is definitely a great value. And then we've got Drizzt saying Seiko Turtle. And then... You know, always a good choice. There are a lot of Seiko and Grand Seiko divers now. Um, I think you can probably get into a full-blown Seiko diver for far less than $5,000 with a movement that's sort of a hand-me-down from Grand Seiko. And I think that's probably the sweet spot. That or buy a used spring drive diver. Something like an SBGA 229 from Grand Seiko or the SBGA 231, which is the titanium version. You get one of those used, you're getting a real value and you probably will be able to get in into them used for less than $5,000. Let's see what else is going on right here. John Doe, just tuned in, recap the last 28 minutes. We talked about why watches are expensive. We took a look at some wrist chats that you guys sent to me. We talked about the Tudor Black Bay 925, Black Bay 58 925. We talked about the Oris Carl Brashear 3. We talked about a Bell & Ross military diver in black ceramic and my favorite sub $5,000 dive watch, which is the Ball Engineer Hydrocarbon Original. What else is going on here? Okay, and then we have Mr. Valju saying, Longines Legend No Date, super compressor case, great 300 meter dive watch with real heritage. That's a true, good point, good point. And recently, they have now put more interesting longer legged movements in those Longines Legend divers. But if you wanna go back to 2007 and get the original Legend diver, No Date, that's also a great piece. If you can prove that it's an early model, I would wanna have some sort of like receipt in the box because those first ones off the line were really breakthrough watches. Let's see what else you guys are saying right here. Okay, so Mark S. is saying, at Thomas Lim, not Tim, he has the JLC Snowdrop Vintage Memovox, the Zin EZM 1.1, his Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter, and the Swatch System 51. I also have a 1974 Belova Accutron Caliber 214 Space View. That was the first interesting watch I bought for myself. Uh, after I got my first job out of college, I paid $400 in cash. And yes, again, at my local vintage watch guy in Huntington Village, I did get $50 off because I was able to pay cash on the spot. There's always a cash price with those small local vendors. And then right here, we have Mark S. Tim, did Magalie Metrier design the ball? I don't think so. I think she's probably best known for doing the ball for BMW watches. I don't think she's still designing for them, but I'll look into that and find out. And then right here, we have English 2 saying, Palagos is indeed under $5,000. This is a good point and an important point. Um, and by the way, used everything from Tudor generally costs less, unless you're talking about the Black Bay 58. The Palagos will cost less than retail if you buy it used. And then we've got Watch Ing saying Breitling Super Ocean 42 millimeters and Time Hill opining, I love the Accutron, hum, and it does hum. All right. Then we've got Renside, a man after my own heart, ball like the Blue Oyster Cult, underrated and they consistently deliver. You know that's true, especially on this show. You know how to get mentioned in the chat box, dude. And then right here we've got a March saying, I want me some Ploprof. If you buy the 2009 steel Ploprof 1200 meter, you buy that used, you probably get, uh, I don't know, six to $7,000. I don't know if you can get into the $5,000 range, maybe without box and paper it's possible. And then right here, we've got 
Macau back saying Doxa sub 200 and Eric R is being smart about this saying, how about Bremont? Great watches. Something like an S301 is a really cool way to get into a vintage style dive watch for less than $5,000. And if you buy a used Supermarine S500, then you get a very cool 50 fathoms like sapphire bezel cover, day date complication, deep diving capability, great ergonomics, and a chronometer certification. A lot to love with Bremont if you're buying a dive watch, whether you want a contemporary style or a vintage style. And then we've got Marco saying, I'm a winner. Huh, that's great. That's very kind of you. You are the best audience on YouTube, guys. You actually say nice things about the host while the host is casting. And then you've got Turkish Meister saying, no love for the Zin 105. We do love the Zin 105. I wish I could be comprehensive in every episode of this show. And then Marco saying, every man needs a steel sports Rolex. Tim Masso needs a steel Rolex on the wrist. It's what winners wear. Uh, and that's where Marco said, and Tim is a winner. So by definition, I need a steel Rolex. And if I do that, it's going to be either, oh, let's just be honest, it's going to be the Milgau Z Blue. Sooner or later, it's going to be the Milgau Z Blue. And I actually work on the Govberg side for a Rolex retailer. So maybe this is the year, guys. Maybe that is my post COVID gift to myself. All right, guys, let's see if we can get this chat. Oh, we got it over 400 live. You guys just made my day. When I can get 400 concurrent, this is a good day. We've got Joe R asking, Tim, are you going to do a collaboration with Ball? Yes, I will do a collaboration with Ball if Ball agrees to it. What I would like to do is for the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook group, which you really should join, we could do the Engineer 2 Magneto S with a Tim Masso signal green accented dial. If we could do that and keep the price somewhere under $3,500, which seems plausible given the retail of the original watch, I would be all over that. I would buy 10 with my own money and then give them out to you guys on the Tim Masso Facebook group. That would be awesome. And then Marco says, hi, Tim. I lied. You suck. That's the internet I, lo and, I, lo I know and love, guys. That's the internet I expect. <laughs> I got to say, even then, that's, that's, that's pretty, I would say, subtle and gentlemanly by the standards of the interweb, where generally the host winds up with his colon and his kidneys and his intestines on the ground, eviscerated and disemboweled by the end of a live stream. You guys are awesome. We got Macau B. Greetings from Bracknell, UK. That is going to be one of my first visits after COVID lockdowns are over. I have not done a collector visit to the UK to meet my friends in the United Kingdom, and that is absolutely going to happen. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. This has been a ton of fun. The bop it a bump 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 was kind of absent today, but I'm going to say bump it a bump a bump. This is the conclusion of our show, but not before we style with some of your own on mine, starting with Patrick W. Captures the majesty of the Matterhorn with his Rolex Air King. Chris M. Impresses with his Blancpain 50 Fathoms, which is the Cadillac of, of dive watches in what must be considered the Ferrari of trucks, the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trackhawk with 700 horsepower. Eric N. and Jack the Dog explore the yard, sniffing at something. With the Rolex Yachtmaster Dark Rhodium Dial, you know I am a fan. Edwin C. of Singapore and his Casio G-Shock polish his uniform service boots for Army Reserve duty later in the month. I've been there. I've done that. Joe C. of Penn, a local boy, rings our dinner bell with his Pita Barcelona Oceania and succulent roast chicken. I am getting hungry, guys. What's for dinner? Wrist shots. That's what. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Comment and subscribe, guys. Stay online with me when the broadcast ends. Talking time with Tim Masso on Facebook. You might even get a ball watch as part of the bargain. And I will be doing everything I can to get the live stream on Wednesday back up and running. We've had Facebook issues, guys. I do my best. Time out, Tim out. Jack and Sean out. And thanks for logging on.